Good morning. I have uh, put on a wireless mic for the first time in I think two and a half years and trying to figure out and remember how I did that. So <laughs> it's, it seems to be coming through. So uh, welcome to worship this morning from the sanctuary of Central Lutheran Church in Spokane, Washington. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, those of you uh, you can see behind me, sort of, now we've gone to the half screen. Uh, there we have a number of folks here in person with us there. They all are on this uh, Palm Sunday. And it's, uh, welcome to all, the, all those of you who are joining us via Zoom this morning. I know it might be a little late to make this announcement, but uh, if you don't have a Palm with you, um, you could run out in the yard and grab a leafy branch. Or if you want to quickly sketch something out of paper, uh, that would work too if you feel like you need a, a palm thing to wave at the appropriate point uh, here. But um, it's a pleasure to have you here as we enter into the contemplation of our Lord's Passion. Now today, we're going to be focusing primarily on Palm Sunday. And then towards the end of the service, we will have a continuation of our gospel text that leads us into Holy Week. So today, primarily focusing on the victorious entry and what it may have meant for people of that time and what it has to say uh, to us today as well. Um, with that said, we do have a couple of services coming up this week for Holy Week. Uh, Monday, Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, we'll be here. It will be our first communion back at the rail after low these many years. And so we will, um, that will be at 7 Good Friday will also be at 7 p.m. Our brothers and sisters from Communitas will be joining us that evening for our Good Friday service. Um, it will be the Passion story um, read in a more narrative style and interspersed with hymns. So uh, we hope that you will join us either in person or uh, both of those services will be uh, on Zoom, the same uh, link for worship uh, for those services as well. And then, of course, our Easter morning um, celebration uh, we're looking forward to hearing from our choir, uh, who have been practicing again and uh, and having communion in our more traditional processional style that morning, and uh, just kind of feeling like uh, we're back to routines that are familiar and comfortable for us. Um, please continue to keep uh, folks in your prayers: Chris Brandenburg, Tom Rounds, Marilyn Mills, uh, and uh, of course, as always, in the prayers, you'll have the opportunity to remember those uh, who are most important to you and in uh, need of God's care and attention. So, All right, uh, we begin this Palm Sunday service with uh, the processional gospel, uh, the blessing of the palms, and a triumphant hymn. So uh, those of you who are behind me, if you would stand if you're able. Uh, the rest of you may stand if you would like. Um, an additional option is, you know, some of the uh, processional stories of Jesus entering Jerusalem also had people throwing cloaks at his feet. So if you have a scarf or uh, something that you could wave, that would work as well. Um, I would pause and give you a chance to go find that, but I don't know how big your closets are, so we're just going to move on. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit calls us together as the people of God. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 19th chapter. After he had said this, Jesus went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the, of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. 
Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered them, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. We praise you, O God, for, the redeeming, for redeeming the world through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Today he entered the holy city in triumph and was proclaimed Messiah and King by those who spread garments and branches along his way. Bless these branches and those who carry them. Grant us grace to follow our Lord in the way of the cross, so that joined to his death and resurrection, we enter into life with you. Through the same Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Sovereign God, you have established your rule in the human heart through the servanthood of Jesus Christ. By your spirit, keep us in the joyful procession of those who with their tongues confess Jesus as Lord and with their lives praise him as Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The word of the Lord. We will read Psalm 47 responsively by verse. Clap your hands, all ye peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is awesome a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God is the king over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. A reading from Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we know at this point in the story that Jesus has set his sights to go to Jerusalem, and uh, we've been following him along that path, traced by the footprints along the wall as we too kind of walk the way toward the cross along with him during this season. And now here we are, Jerusalem geographical and, and hermeneutical center of Luke's gospel. It begins and ends in the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus' final journey to Jerusalem happens over many chapters. In Luke, from chapter 9, verse 51, where Jesus sets his face to go to Jerusalem, right up until chapter 19, verse 28, when Jesus finally goes up to Jerusalem. This is where our text and the final week of Jesus' earthly ministry now begins. Jesus going up to Jerusalem is a very public event, interpreted by Luke as a royal entry. Now, there are two ways, really, to look at this story and to read this passage. First of all, that Jesus, as the Son of God, can, in fact, predict the future and That's what he's doing here. He's describing what he has already foreseen for the disciples. That is to say, I'm looking down the road of the future, and I see this colt tied up, and I see this room ready, and go make it so. The second way to look at it is that Jesus, as the Son of God, loves humanity enough to embrace the destiny he has been proclaiming since early on, that he would go to Jerusalem and he would die there. And so in accepting that, he has made arrangements for his entrance into Jerusalem. He has planned in advance. It's not the first time he's been there, even though he expects that that entrance will, in fact, lead to his death. Now, surprise, surprise, I kind of prefer the second of these options. It's not that I, that I have any concerns about Jesus' ability to see into the future or about what he knows or doesn't know, but he's been predicting his death in Jerusalem throughout his long trek there with his disciples. Rather, I think that Jesus' carefully made plans reflect his commitment to go to the city that will reject and crucify him because of his great love for that city and indeed for all the world. So the fact that Jesus enters into Jerusalem riding on a colt to the acclamation of the crowds recalls the prediction we heard in our Old Testament lesson from Zechariah, right? Behold, rejoice, O daughter Zion, shout aloud, your king comes to you triumphant and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey on the colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, this verse is not cited in our text from Luke, although both Matthew and John have it in their version of the story. Luke does not, although I strongly believe that Luke's understanding of this event is informed by that prophecy in Zechariah. The, the, the royal implications of this entry on a cult are clear in the words of the whole multitude of disciples who praise God for the deeds of power. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing, too, that not every one of the gospel writers calls the things that Jesus does miracles. Some of them call them deeds of power. And if you are someone who is in a position of authority and influence, and here comes somebody doing deeds of power, okay, so put a check mark by that to keep an eye on it. So the disciples are praising his entry, marveling at the deeds of power, and calling out the words from Psalm 118, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Except here in Luke, and again, just in Luke, Luke has them saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. So a little bit of a modification there from the psalm. And I think One of the things that that does is it changes the whole nature of this parade. 
right? This is no longer just welcoming a local celebrity or returning astronauts. This has become a protest march. This has become a political statement. Jesus has brought his deeds of power, I mean, from an Old Testament point of view, healings, miracles, providing for the poor, these were all things that the rightful king of the nation ought to be doing. So figure that's tucked away in the back of the minds of all these people as well. Jesus brings his deeds of power into a city ruled by authoritarian oppressors. This is not going to end well. The second part of the multitude's acclamation, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven, should ring bells for you without me having to say anything further. The words of the angels, right? The proclamation of Jesus' birth. It is the recognition of the crowds gathered that this is, in fact, the Messiah, the one born to bring in the kingdom, the Christ, the King who is to come. So, as you would expect, and as our text tells us, this acclamation makes the Pharisees very nervous. Some of them have already warned him earlier in the gospel that Herod was out to kill him, right? And Jesus' response was, go tell that fox Herod that I'm going to continue what I'm doing. Now, again, there are Pharisees who implore Jesus to get his disciples to quit saying this stuff. It's going to cause trouble. Stop their subversive chant. The Pharisees understand how these types of royal pretensions may very well bring down the wrath of those who are in power in Jerusalem, whether it be the Sanhedrin, whether it be Herod, whether it be Pilate. And in fact, we know that Jesus will stand before all three of those before too long. But just as Jesus had brushed aside the Pharisees' warnings earlier, he does so again. And he tells them, I'll tell you, if these disciples were silent, the very stones themselves would shout out. Jesus knows full well the opposition that he faces, but he will not be deterred from his mission. I think it was William Barclay, the Scottish... New Testament scholar who was committed to making the Bible accessible to everyone, and so he wrote uh, a commentary in the language of the people of his day, which was near a century ago. But he talks about the fact that there are two kinds of courage. There's the kind of courage that prompts someone to throw him or herself in the way of a car or a bus to save someone else and shove them aside, and that's the kind of thing that happens spontaneously. It's, it's uh, the kind of bravery that's instinctual and habitual and it's revealed in a moment of crisis. And then there's also the kind of courage that sees danger coming from a long way away. And there's plenty of time to choose an alternative path. And yet it chooses to stay the course, to endure the mounting fear in order to do what is necessary and right. I think it's the second kind of courage that we see in Jesus. He knows what lies ahead. He sees it coming for him most of his life. He has plenty of opportunity to flee to the path of safety, and yet he doesn't. He stays the course, endures the fear, makes plans to embrace it in love and wrestle it to death. By his stripes, Isaiah said, we are healed. And by his courage, I might add, we are set free from fear. Now it's worth noting that Jesus' earlier response to the Pharisees' warnings led directly into a lament over Jerusalem. The same is the case here. Jesus' retort to the Pharisees leads directly into another lament over Jerusalem. This one accompanied, the text tells us, by weeping. Although our assigned text for this morning ends at verse 40, 
The lament of Jesus in verses 41 to 44, followed by his clearing of the temple of its vendors in verses 48 to 45, are all of a piece. They happen on the same day, according to Luke. We're going to hear that part of the text at the end of the service. But the lament in particular offers a poignant interpretation of the events taking place. Jesus says, if you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace. Jesus doesn't say this, but I'll add, I'm riding on a colt for heaven's sakes. If only you recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. Jesus goes on to describe the destruction that is coming down upon Jerusalem and finishes by saying that these tragic events will happen, and I quote, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. The time of visitation was intended to bring salvation to Israel. As Zechariah announced In Luke chapter 1, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably upon or visited his people and redeemed them. Jesus now weeps because many in Israel have not recognized him as the Messiah and Lord and have not accepted his peaceful visitation. Their refusal of the things that make for peace will have tragic consequences for the nation. In Luke, as in the prophets, the city of Jerusalem is personified. In Jesus' lament, Jerusalem represents and is symbolic of the people of Israel, and in a larger sense, all of humanity. It is the center of the opposition against him, but it is also the center of God's salvific purpose for all people. Now, in the sequel to Luke, the Acts of the Apostles, it is from Jerusalem that the good news will spread to every corner of the earth. So it is that Jesus, knowing the opposition that lies before him, nevertheless remains undeterred in his mission, entering boldly into the temple and clearing out the vendors and then teaching in the temple every day until his arrest. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem is royal, triumphant, and controversial. And we know how the people will turn against him. We know that many in the crowds who hail Jesus as king on this Sunday will be crying out for his crucifixion by Friday. Perhaps they expected a mighty warrior king who would drive out the Romans. And seeing Jesus instead held by Roman soldiers, weak and vulnerable, they will decide that he is not the king they want after all. And in fact, supporting him could be downright dangerous. So, where do we see ourselves in this story. Now, remember, we have the advantage of 2,000 years of hindsight, right? We know who he is. We've read the story. We know how it ends. It's easy to look back at this crowd and think that our reactions would have been different. But I wonder if we are, in fact, really so different from them. After all, how quickly does our faith falter when God does not deliver what we are expecting? How quickly does our discipleship falter when we realize the great costs and the risks of following him? How often do our self-serving instincts lead us to deny Jesus and his claim on our lives? The unfolding passion story in front of us records a variety of human responses to Jesus, from faith and jubilant praise to mockery, hostility, and violence. 
And yet throughout this story of vacillating human responses, of human blindness and weakness and hardness of heart, one thing remains constant. God's will to show mercy. God's will to save. Without jumping ahead to the end of the story just yet, we can affirm that even in the midst of this human tragedy, God is at work for good. Amen.
the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. We pray for the church called to follow Jesus in the way of the cross. Make us unflinching servants of the gospel. Deliver us from hardship as we confront the forces of injustice and practice radical compassion. We pray for our Muslim neighbors observing the holy month of Ramadan and for our Jewish neighbors preparing for Passover. Merciful God, receive our prayer. For the earth and all its inhabitants created in love, train us to recognize your divine goodness in the world around us. Rouse in us a reverence for creation that we take greater care of its resources. We pray for all areas and people suffering damage, injury, or loss of life in spring storms. Merciful God, receive our prayer. For those in positions of authority called to lead with integrity and compassion, supply them with the courage and the vulnerability when challenged with new ideas. Deliver them from fear that limits imagination and impedes justice. Merciful God, receive our prayer. For those who suffer, waiting expectantly for mercy and consolation, accompany those who feel abandoned or betrayed, defend those who are wrongly accused, and embrace those who are incarcerated or detained. Stem the wide, stem the tide of violence. We pray for the victims of violence in Ukraine and for all witnesses of the atrocities of war and for the victims and survivors of the mass shooting in Sacramento. Heal those who are ill or recovering, especially Kay Anderson, Chris Brandenburg, Marilyn Mills, Tom Rounds, and all we name before you in our silent prayers. We also thank you for those who are willing to risk their own safety to serve others. Merciful God, receive our prayers. For Christians around the world, preparing this week to journey with Jesus to the cross, Reveal to us once again the earth-shaking power of humble service, unmerited forgiveness, and sacrificial love. Lead us all from death to life. Merciful God, receive our prayers. We remember those who have died, who, ha who were commended into your hands. Remember us when you come into your kingdom and prepare a place for each of us with you in paradise. Merciful God, receive our prayers. Accept the prayers we bring, O oh God, on behalf of a world in need, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please take a moment to share that peace with those around you, and for those of you who are joining us on the Zoom, feel free to share a piece of, uh, piece of peace and welcome on the chat.
Let us pray. Extravagant God, you have blessed us with the fullness of creation. Now we gather at your feast where you offer us the food that satisfies. Take and use what we offer here. Come among us and feed us with the body and blood of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Here is food and drink for the journey. Take and be filled. body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Now the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. 
Sustain us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms a making of peace, and our prayer the song of grateful hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You are children of God, anointed with the oil of gladness and strengthened for the journey. Almighty God, motherly, majestic, and mighty, bless you in this day and always. Amen. We now enter into the contemplation of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ and meditate on the salvation of the world through his sufferings, death, burial, and resurrection. A reading from Luke, the 19th chapter. If you're able, please stand. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. Then he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling things there. And he said, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching in the temple. The chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people kept looking for a way to kill him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were spellbound by what they heard.
Go in peace. Jesus meets you on the way. Thanks be to God.